Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up. And he will lift you up. Good morning, everyone. It's a great day. Holiday. Hope everyone has some time off to share. And I'm glad you're here to share your time with us this morning. It's a good opportunity to, to be together and uh, come together to worship our Lord, pray with each other, sing songs together, and encourage each other so that we never give up and never forget our eternal home. Well, you may have noticed we have a new guy, a new family with us today. They're <laughs> Danny and Kim are here. And uh, they're excited to be here, and I know we are. It seemed like it seemed like for everybody, July was never going to come. Well, well, maybe for Will and I, we were kind of glad July came. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so they're moving in. They're moving in next door and, and trying to get things organized. That looked to me like that's probably another couple of weeks before they're done with that. But uh, they're glad to be here. Danny's going to be. Uh, doing the, uh, the lesson this morning, so he was all excited about getting right to it. He even went to Dunkin' Donuts yesterday to get ready, so <laughs> it's a good man. <laughs> so let's begin our worship this morning and uh, go to our Father in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this wonderful day. We thank you that we can be together. We thank you that we live in a country that we can worship you freely. And pray, Father, as those who oppress us and try to stop that, that you will stand in their way and that our freedoms here are, are continue on. We thank you so much for all those who prepared this morning, and we pray that they'll have good, good uh, recall as to what they wanted to share with us. We uh, all come together here in the name of your Son, and it's through him we pray, amen. Good to see everybody. I, I'm sure you've heard it said, but I'll repeat it. The song leader has the best seat in the house. You guys always sound wonderful, and the more, the better. Standing on the promises. 452, if you're using the book. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of
promises of God, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, And 57. A couple pages over. <coughs> Excuse me. Mm. How firm a foundation ye saints of the Lord is laid for your faith. It is excellent. will be number 917. Number 917, and now we'll have our scripture reading and then our lesson. Proverbs, I'm, so, I'm looking at Psalms. <laughs> yes. I did not have my coffee this morning, I'm sorry. I was making hamburger patties at six this morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Pro Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a disgrace to any people. Good morning. morning. Let's pray. Father in heaven, open our eyes that we may see, open our ears that we may hear, open our hearts that we may obey, be fruitful and multiply. Fill us with your spirit, fill us with your joy, Teach us to be cheerful givers of our time, of our treasure, of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Brothers and sisters, 
Jesus is alive and well and working in the world today. Amen? Amen. I, um, Kimberly and I are so very excited to be here. Seems like this move has taken forever. And uh, boy, oh boy, the way y'all helped us on Friday, it is unbelievable. I'm so, so grateful for all of the work that you did. I feel like you've adopted us, and that's a, and that's a real good feeling. The house is beautiful. We can't wait to invite you over to enjoy it with us. And, um, of course, that'll be when we get the boxes out of the way, and I'm sure some of you have been told about the boxes. We have too much stuff. That's what it boils down to. It's an honor to come up here and work with you guys. I've seen from afar your good works for years. Park and I served on the board at Ganderbrook for a good long time. And, and in the time that I spent teaching uh, every summer at Ganderbrook for a number of years, I see some faces that, uh, that I remember seeing out there. Any of, were any of y'all actually campers when I was teaching there? Please don't raise your hand. That would make me feel <laughs> terribly, terribly old. But uh, so really for Kim and me, coming here to Manchester is about as close to coming home as this southern boy can imagine. We loved our time in Maine, and we are look, looking forward to loving our time here in New Hampshire. Thank you, thank you, thank you for inviting us. I can't wait to see what God does with us together. Now, were you to travel to Plymouth, Massachusetts, you would find a huge monument erected there. Some of you probably know the monument that I'm speaking. Anybody remember that? Anybody seen that? There was a movie done about it a few years ago. Erected back in the 1800s in honor of the pilgrims. It's thought to be the world's largest solid granite monument. It's, 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 it's enormous. The monument honors faith that's at its center, the right hand, her right hand pointing toward heaven, and in her left hand, she's holding a Bible. Buttressing faith, one would see four other figures, four seated figures under faith, which illustrate the principles upon which the pilgrims founded their movement, their government, morality, law, education, and liberty. Under morality, one would see the evangelist and the prophet. Under law, one would see justice and mercy. Under education, one would see youth and wisdom. And under liberty, you would see tyranny overthrown and peace. And it kind of shows a progression from morality to law to education to liberty. That's what's kind of illustrated by that, by that monument. Faith at the center, again, buttressed by morality, law, education, and liberty. 400 years ago, 102 people, 41 men, banded together in faith, seeking to establish morality, law, education, and liberty. They bound themselves together in the Mayflower Compact, establishing Christian government on these barren shores. 400 years ago, 100 people, only 41 men. The freedom that we enjoy today began not far from here in New England with, that band, with the arrival of that band of brothers and sisters, most of whom were devoted to the study and obedience to the words written in the Bible. They didn't know much about how to survive in this world, in this new world, but it worked out, and here we are enjoying the fruit of their labor, which began, which, which, which began so long ago under such long odds with not, without much of an opportunity of them to succeed. Were they perfect? Of course not. Man is profoundly imperfect. And though I look forward to seeing us do great things up here in New Hampshire, I'm very excited about that. I have no illusions. People are messy. We're messy. Some of y'all are messy. I don't know what the mess is. I look forward to finding out, though. But God, but God is great. 
And he knows how to use us, even though we are earthen vessels, even though we're jars of clay, he knows how to use us to do great things. The scripture is replete with examples of that happening. God establishes the nations. God established the church. And he knows what he's doing with us right here, right now in Manchester, New Hampshire. I know you've been studying the book of Acts on Wednesday nights. I got a, I got a passage from Acts that I'd like to share with you, uh, that I'd like to reflect on in the next uh, few minutes. You probably already read it. It's from Paul's sermon at the Areopagus in Athens. I'm going to begin reading in verse 24. Paul says, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God gives us life and breath and all things. If you have received a blessing, where did it come from? Came from God. Oh, they answered Kim. <laughs> Amen. Park must have trained y'all well. It came from God. We want to give ourselves the credit, right? To pat ourselves on the back. Lord, we cleared this land. We plowed it. We sowed it and harvested it. We cooked the harvest. It wouldn't be here, and we wouldn't be eating it if we hadn't done it all ourselves. We work dog bone hard for every crumb and morsel, but we thank you, Lord, just the same for the food we're about to eat. Amen. Any movie buffs out there? Shenandoah, 1965. That's Charlie Anderson's prayer, his prayer of thanksgiving. It doesn't sound very grateful, does it? And if you watch the movie, you learned that Charlie Anderson didn't have as much control over his life and over his family, over his, even his survival as he thought he did. It's a wonderful movie. Entertaining, but that prayer does not illustrate the way we should see things, does it? Life is hard. We all work hard. We're all going to work hard. And it's tempting as we labor. It's tempting as we pursue a vigorous life. And God's called us to a vigorous life. It's tempting to feel as though it's all under our control. And we all make it happen. Isn't it tempting to feel that way sometimes? But that's not how Paul, who by the way, could we agree that the Apostle Paul was a hard worker? Yeah, yeah. That's not how he saw things. And that's not what he preached at the Areopagus. He gives to all. And who is all? All, right? He gives to all life and breath and all things. That's how it works. Any good thing you have received in, from, from, in life comes from God and comes from his love for us. Now, verse 26. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries, boundaries of their dwelling. So, so where, do, where do the nations come from? From God. From one blood. We all descend from Adam and Eve. He made us all from one blood. Doesn't leave any room for racism, does it? Doesn't leave any room to judge people on external appearances, does it? Because under the skin, what are we? We're all the same. We all come from the same blood. All nations come from the same blood. And who did that? Who created all this diversity in this world? Who created all of the nations? Every tribe and tongue and nation. God made that happen along with the many other nations that we've seen rise and fall throughout history, God has established the nations that are here today. When the Assyrians overran the ten northern tribes, they were doing so because God established the Assyrians to do so. It was their time. When the Babylonians overran Judah and Benjamin, taking them off into captivity, they did so because God had established the Babylonians to do so. It was their time. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, far removed from Rome, but under Rome's domination, God had raised up Rome to dominate the world at that time. It was Rome's time. 
But you know what else was going on then? God was doing a new thing. He was establishing the kingdom. A kingdom that we belong to even today. So it's our time now, y'all. No matter what nation may rise, no matter what nation may fall, we are privileged to be subjects of the king in his eternal kingdom. God establishes the nations. He determines their boundaries. There was a time for Rome. There was a time for Assyria. There was a time for Babylon. There was a time for England, upon which, for a time, the sun never sat. The sun never would set on the British Empire. And there will be a time for America. Who knows? How long? We don't know. God, that's in God's hands. He establishes the nations. He established the church. And he knows what he's doing with you and me. Verse 27. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. So why does God do what he does among the nations? So that they should seek the Lord, so that we would seek him. That's why he does what he does. His, the response that he wants from us is to seek his face, is to seek his ways, is to seek his kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Our response, that should be our response to God's work in our lives and God's work among the nations. He is in charge more than the president, more than the governor, more than the Supreme Court, more than the legislature, more than any potentate that may be lifted up to dominate and rule over us. God is in charge and they will answer to him. He's the one we should seek. He's the one to whom we should appeal during troublesome times. He's the one to whom we should appeal during times of ease and safety and good things. He's the one. Because he's the one who is able to set things right. And that's a good thing, isn't it? Because the longer I live, the less I have faith that those for whom I vote are able to straighten anything out. Don't get me wrong. I vote... I vote, I vote. But I've learned to pray and pray and pray a little more than I vote and vote and vote. Because there's something going on that we don't have control over in the ways of government. So we should be talking to God about that a lot more than we do. I need to know the Bible, and I need to vote for people who govern according to biblical principles, but we must remember that it is God who is at work among the nations. He's demonstrated that for centuries. He raises them up and he puts them down. And Paul preaching in Athens tells us this in this, in this little segment that I've been sharing with you. He establishes the nations. He established the church. And he knows what he's doing with us. If you don't remember anything else today, please remember that. Proverbs 14.34 tells us that he does what he does in the nations according to righteousness. What did we just read? Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Are you a patriot? Do you love America? If you do, then you should love righteousness. You should walk in righteousness. You should seek to establish righteousness. Why? Because righteousness exalts a nation. If we want our nation to be great, right? We hear this, make America great again. How about make America good again? Because see, if we can become good again, the greatness will follow. Well, why? Because righteousness exalts a nation and sin is a reproach to any people. Do we believe that? And I wonder... Have we seen a departure of righteousness in recent years? I don't want to be unfair. I believe when it comes to racial matters, we've made great progress. 
the marriage that my wife and I have been blessed by for the past almost 34 years was illegal in many places when we were children. So there's been great progress that has been made along that line. But there are storm clouds on the horizon. And I don't believe there are even storm clouds. I believe the storm is raging, especially when it comes to sexual matters. If we've reached a point where one believes that one can choose one's own sex, in spite of what God's word says when he says, male and female created he them, and in spite of just plain old science and biology, if we've reached that point and the government supports it and the culture accepts it and promotes it, that denotes a departure from righteousness. When we choose to redefine what God has defined, when marriage is defined for us in Genesis chapter 2, when Adam and Eve were presented to one another, and we claim that one can have a same-sex marriage partner, that denotes a departure from righteousness. And we're in trouble. And on and on it goes. God is holy. God is righteous. And he exalts righteousness. And he does not exalt wickedness. So what will he do with the United States of America? But maybe I'm asking the wrong question when I ask that. Because if he establishes the nations, and if he establishes the church, and the church is going to supersede all nations. And the church is going to endure forever. And the gates of Hades will not prevail against the church. Then isn't it more about the choices that we make in the church and with our families and in our daily lives than it is about the governor or the president or the senator or the congressman or the Supreme Court justice? Here's what I mean. Who thought they were in charge when a little baby was born in Bethlehem? Who thought they were in charge when that baby grew up, submitted to, and overcame death? Who thought they were in charge when his disciples, those who followed him, followed him to death, many of them, hymns being sung. Some of them ran to the lions rather than giving up uh, give, giving up on their faith. Where's the Roman Empire today? Christ's kingdom outlasted it, and Christ's kingdom will outlast every other kingdom of man. Kingdoms rise and fall. Institutions drift away from their foundational principles. Even families that in one generation are faithful and solid and strong often lapse into faithlessness, but not the church. Not the church the kingdom against which the gates of Hades will never prevail. Not the church, our kingdom, the kingdom in which we're privileged to serve as kings and priests. Do you realize that's what we are? Kings and priests, he's made that of us? Not the church. Like the Mayflower, we may seem, be, be, seem to be kind of weak, ragtag, few in number, small, but a group that is powerful because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. Do we believe that? Amen. You want to know what is the best hope for America's survival and prosperity? <clears throat> We're looking at it. His church, His people, His kingdom. Because we are God's ultimate weapon for righteousness, without which the nation will not long endure. So we've got some work to do. We've also got the power of God in us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. And I, like Jonathan and his armor bearer, like our odds. Let's talk to our Father in heaven about it. Lord, we thank you that you've granted us the privilege to be a part of the everlasting kingdom of God. We thank you, Lord,
for our heritage, yes, as Americans, but more importantly, our heritage as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ who established a kingdom long ago that will supersede all other kingdoms. Lord, we're not going to sugarcoat it because you know the reality of the situation. Times morally in our country are tough. But we look to you to reestablish what you once established. Help us, Lord, to be obedient. Help us, Lord, to be disciples worth following. Help us, Lord, to follow you with our whole heart. And Lord, we pray that you would save your church, and we know you will. And we also pray that you would save our land, and we hope you will. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I said in the beginning, Kim and I are very, very grateful to be here with all of you. Everything that I said today is frankly just window dressing if you're not part of that kingdom about which we have been reflecting. Are you in his kingdom? Have you confessed Christ? Have you been baptized into Christ? Have your sins been washed away? Have you been filled with his Holy Spirit? Have you been added to his church? If you know what I'm asking when I'm asking you those questions and you have not done so, it is my earnest prayer that you will do so and that you'll do so today. Why delay? If when I asked you those questions, you're like, okay, I'm not sure what he's talking about. We need to talk. We need to talk today. And now would be, today would be a great time to talk. We got hot dogs, we got beans, we got all sorts of stuff. So let's have that conversation today. Don't delay. If you feel the need and if you're ready to do so today, come forward while we stand and sing. But if you're not ready to do that and you've got some questions, let's have a talk. Thank you. Supper. Let's turn now to number 335. You're using the song. In memory of the Savior's love, 335.
Today is Independence Day, July 4th. It's where this nation threw off the shackles of tyranny and took its rightful place among the nations of the world. For the Christian, to me, in my humble opinion, that Easter Sunday is our Independence Day because when Jesus rose from the dead, that showed that he was who he said he was but the Apostle Paul observed that if Jesus was still dead, if he was still in the grave, then we would have been pitied among all men because we believe he rose. And if he didn't rise, we're still in our sins. And uh, so on this Independence Day, I'd like to share a scripture with you. And it's one of my favorites. It's Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 1, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through, the, through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives you life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Every Sunday we take of these emblems to remind ourselves, well, Jesus told us that we ought to do this in his memory, but it's, it's a constant reminder at what price God paid to grant us liberty from the law, liberty from sin. And uh, so uh, that said, I understand we have a little bit of a logistics problem. So if you don't have a communion cup set, we have bread and we have uh, food of the vine, which we'll be disseminating as we used to do. So, if you would bow with me, please. Father, we thank you so very much for the love that you shower upon us. We thank you for your son who was willing to live a sinless life, be nailed to a cross, be placed in the tomb, and rise three days later. We celebrate his resurrection, Lord. We celebrate our liberty in Christ. We thank you, Lord, that in Christ there is no condemnation. And so, Lord, we pray you be with us this morning as we take of these emblems, as we take of this bread, which symbolizes his body, and that we do this in a manner that's pleasing to you. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If, if you don't have a communion cup, could you raise your hand so?
Let's continue in prayer. Father, we thank you for this cup which symbolizes the blood that was shed on the cross. More importantly, Father, it's the blood of the new covenant which fulfilled the law, the old covenant, and held it in a new covenant, a covenant of grace. And so, Lord, we are so grateful and we thank you for this opportunity we have to uh, remember the sacrifice of your son, to remember the significance and the eternal significance of what he accomplished on the cross of Calvary. Again, be with us as we take this cup and that we may do so in a manner that is pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Did we get everybody? If not, raise your hand. Okay. This concludes our observance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, we will now have, an, well, we leave the plate up here for those who give in person. But at this time, we uh, just want to acknowledge that, as Danny said so profoundly in his lesson, is that everything we have is from God, and that God really doesn't need anything from us. But he has also commanded that we be people who are generous, that we give to ease suffering, that we give to help others. And we live in a physical world, and to maintain the church, the, the physical plant, and the higher uh, people to work f and do things for us, to, like uh, upgrading the parsonage and the repairs around the building. Well, it takes it takes resources, and all of us have purposed, depending on how much we have been prospered to give back to God. And I want to emphasize that, that when we give, you're not giving to the church, you're not giving to Barry, you're not giving to me or Danny, you're giving to God. And God 
and you have entrusted us to make those decisions, to use the funds that we're entrusted with appropriately. And everything that we do is for the propagation of the gospel, is to create an environment, to create the ability to spread the gospel, which is why we are here and which is what we're about. And so, uh, having said that, uh, would you bow with me? Father, again, we come before you, and we do thank you for all the blessings that you give us. We thank you for the blessings of liberty which we enjoy in this country. We thank you that we have the ability to meet and to speak and to do those things that you would have us do because uh, without fear of our government, without fear of being arrested, without fear of being put in jail for proclaiming the name of Jesus. But also, Lord, we are grateful for the abilities that you have given us to be able to earn a living to provide food, shelter, and clothing for ourselves and, and our families. And we thank you for the ability that we have to give and support the efforts of the church your efforts to spread the gospel, to make disciples of men and women, and to have them take part to accept and participate in this wonderful gift of salvation, which all starts with you. And so, Lord, we pray you would bless us as we give, that our gifts would be pleasing and acceptable to you. Indeed, that everything we do would would fit that description. We pray you forgive us of our sins, and we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we stand in your presence. We're so grateful, Father, that we can see the, your works around us, your creation that you made for us to enjoy, to be able, also to be able to utilize for whatever possibilities we can in regards to uh, getting around or being able to uh, appreciate uh, the fact that you know we have skills and abilities that uh, as the people of Israel found out when they were building the temple that God endowed those people with the abilities to do all kinds of crafts and uh, we have different crafts today but we have different amounts of knowledge that you have blessed us with. Science likes to take away the, uh, the privilege of knowing that you all things come from you, but we know down deep that if it weren't for your intervention, your love, none of this would be possible. We're grateful, Father, for your kingdom, for the privilege of having Jesus as our King and Lord and Savior. We know, Father, that we're all lost without him, that without his going to the cross, we'd all be just floundering, just aimlessly going about. We are grateful for your word, for the wisdom and knowledge of your word to teach us if we have open hearts, pray, Father, that we just spend more time in it, continued time searching for it, learning more of it, and being uh, an encouragement to others with it. We're grateful, Father, for the final lesson we heard this morning from Dan. We hope that as we contemplate this holiday, that will keep in mind that things happen around that we're not always aware of, but they have a purpose. 
and that your word has shown us that through time. We're grateful for that, Father. We're grateful, Father, for the family that we meet with here in this community, for the encouragement, the fellowship, the love that is here. We're grateful, Father, for opportunity to be together, not only this day, but on Wednesday evenings. Look forward to spending eternity with you and all the other saints, and there's so many more that uh, we're looking forward to meeting someday. We're grateful, Father, for your forgiveness. We know that we sin, we stumble in so many ways, and we hope we can be to each other as you are to us, that we can forgive one another when we hurt each other. We're grateful for all our earthly families that you bless us with, too. Some of us uh, have families that are not faithful, but we hope that someday they will come to know of the saving grace of Jesus. And whoever shares it with them, we hope that they come to know from us that we hope and pray, Father, some fertile hearts that will come to understand and learn to love you as we have been blessed. Thank you again for this time, and may you continue to bless the rest of our day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, uh have a few announcements before we're dismissed this morning. What's that? This was at, my, this was at our house and at somebody's very nice computer. <laughs> that ain't mine. Hmm. Oh. I recognize this? Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, we'll lock it in the office and... Uh, well, you need a new computer, Danny? No. <laughs> so uh, a couple announcements before we're dismissed. As mentioned before, we have a cookout um, this morning. That is going to be after adult Bible class. So we hope and that you'll stay for, for that. Uh, the Therians and others have got enough food here to feed about 400 people. So I think about 40 signed up. And uh, just want to let you know, and if guilt works, uh, that's okay, too. We brought a lot of food because you said you were coming, so we hope you'll stay and eat it. Rich lives next to me, and I don't want to have to do it. I mean, we don't want to throw it away, but I'll be eating a lot of, I'll be eating a lot of hamburgers for the next month if you don't help me out. I uh, have a, a, an announcement here from, from Candy, and, uh, or, or just an update. Uh, this is from Frida. I want to thank the entire church family for all the love and support for, uh, for my mom and her, rec her recovery. This shows how much love the Manchester Church has for each other. This has been a difficult time for my family. My mom is a very strong woman, and she amazes me each time I see her. Though all, through all this, I understand she's not just another mother to her children. She also uh, is a mom and a mentor to many of the members of the church. I know that we will continue to have prayers for my mom and the family with her healing. I'm also asking you to continue to pray for my household, and especially me. We have been going through so much the past seven months, it's taken an emotional toll on me and Randy. Satan is trying hard to step in. I assure you that we are focusing on what the Lord wants and working together. I want to also uh, thank those in the church family that I've confided some of these struggles and thank them for their love and support. I have moments like this morning that I'm an emo emotional basket case and I feel that I need a lot of private time not being able to handle large groups. I miss you all and, and I will worship virtually today. I pray I will be there soon, hopefully with my mom by my side. Love, Candy. So that's an update she wanted us to have. Uh, so Frida is uh, at her son's house, Bob, and there's an insert 
uh, in, the, in the bulletin today that has that information in there. Uh, again, uh, the church barbecue is today. Uh, today, uh, we will not be having evening service, so once we're done here this morning, please spend the time with your families. There's going to be an upcoming congregational retreat at Ganderbrook. I think Steve's putting that together for us. That's going to be August 27th to the 29th. So if you have any questions, uh, you, know, you can ask him. He'll, he'll fill you in the details. It says here, Heather Bell is collecting photos for a bulletin board pictorial directory. Uh, if your directory photo is small or blurry, or you've added family members, or you don't have a directory photo, uh, we're coming after you with a camera. If you prefer, we can email recent photo, or you can email recent photo of yourself or your family to both Heather and or the church uh, office. It says Peggy and Penny are still asking for our prayers. Both are lonely and somewhat anxious. Cards are great. Call and check with Bedford Hills and Hillsboro if you want to visit. Restrictions are easing, easing, but you just can't walk in. So, uh, Dave? Uh, Brotherhood gathering at my home Saturday, this upcoming Saturday at 5 o'clock. Another cookout, so we, I encourage all the men, the brothers, to attend. It's at 5 o'clock. And if you're going to attend, please let me know. We'll have plenty of food. Okay, so um, we do have some refreshments downstairs. Bible class is at 11 o'clock, and uh, we hope to see you all then. We're dismissed.